We are joined by John Frankel, who is the correspondent for Real Sports with Brian Gumbel, who just finished up a piece that airs on HBO tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern on sports cards. Not only the traditional cards sitting somewhere in your basement, but he's also focusing on a new wave of digital assets in the form of NFTs. John has also worked for ABC News, NBC, NFL Films, and is also a Syracuse alum like ourselves. So truthfully, John, I'm trying to learn about collectibles as I see this incredible boom in the market. So what's your best piece of advice for someone just getting started after speaking to some of the most successful card collectors in the world? Here's the piece of advice. Like anything, do your homework. I like that. Um, you know, but these guys gave us the impression that there are a lot of people out there who have the sense that, oh, I'm just going to go buy my pack of cards at the local store um, and I'm going to hit it big and I'm going to get a few cards and I'm going to trade and boom. No, you really have to understand because as, as I was learned and saw firsthand and, and quite frankly, overwhelmed when we went to the national, which is the largest card show uh, of the year in Chicago. And it's just acres and acres, it seems like, of, of um, tables and booths set up. And it's, how do you know what it is you want to get? How do you know what really has value? You know, look, somebody stamps a Mickey Mantle card and it's, you know, uh, it, it says uh, this is $6,500 or that one's $10,000 or that one's $200. How do you know? Maybe the $200 one is, is the better buy. And, and just because something's priced higher doesn't mean ultimately it's going to have more value. So bottom line, do your homework. This is not throw a dart. Granted, there is luck involved, right? You watch these shows and these podcasts that these collectors are putting on and they're breaking packs. Yeah, you can get lucky if you bought that pack that they break and then all of a sudden in it is a Giannis card or a, a Strasburg, you know, at one point, you know, if you're talking baseball, um, you know, if you were doing football and there's a time, sure, you can get lucky, but there's real homework involved. So when you look at this industry in general, and also I think a big a development that we've seen, as you mentioned, is there's a big market for these modern players, whereas for a long time, it was always, okay, you want a piece of history that can make a bit more sense. You're going after an old card with scarcity. Now it's, it's almost manufactured scarcity, right? Like this card is one out of a hundred, or this card is one out of this. And you have these kids chasing after them in packs and chasing after them. Like you mentioned at these stores, uh, do you think that there's any level of almost gambling to it as everyone's trying to hit big? You see on on social media, the, you know, this guy pulled a big card here and now these kids are taking their money and going to, to open the packs. It's a fun hobby, but also there's a level of chasing this profit, right, that I've never really seen before in the hobby. That's right. I think I think it's gone from fun, fun to fortune, if you will. Right. That's what people are looking at. I mean, still, there's that innocent kid who's who starts out at six or seven, but very quickly kids are realizing that, oh, I got this card and the kid on the playground wants it for more money and so I can make a buck. Um, you're, I think you're absolutely right when you talk about gambling and maybe even the better word is, is speculation like stocks, mm -hmm. um, right? Which is Kurt Rappaport, who's in our piece, who's a very successful real estate guy in Los Angeles. And he looked at it and he said, well, wait a minute. And his, his findings were that Car trading has, um, you know, outperformed the S&P 500 over the last 20 years. So let me get into this the same way that he's gotten into art collecting um, and whether it's people who collect, you know, watches or, or cards. Um, I think the, the point that you hit on and I mentioned his name, you know, Steven Strasberg. But it's it's yes, the vintage cards, and that's probably where the better value still lies, right? Where you're where you're known that somebody has has proven their they have a proven performance, there's a legacy there. <laughs> Most important actually is that they've they you know what they've done in their career. And winning a championship certainly helps that, you know, in Giannis's situation that took cards and, and escalated the value of them. So you look at players and you know their career is already done and they've got the championship. But what it also does is it guards against injury, right? So apparently what we learned is that Strasburg's cards were, were hugely valuable. And then his career doesn't pan out the way that everybody expected it to. And all of a sudden the value just plummets. You know, and you'd be surprised by 
guy's cards and their values. You know, if I told you that Julius Irving, Dr. J of the Philadelphia 76 is that on the face of it, a single card of his is not worth all that much. But there is one particular card where he's on it with Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. And that card is worth a great deal to traders. And you you mentioned uh, Kurt Rappaport and you spent a lot of time with him and he has one of the most impressive collections of sports cards I think I've ever seen. He has the Honus Wagner card that he bought for $3.7 million and people are saying they offered him double the price. And, and in fact, just last week, that very same card, not his, but that very same card, Peter, the T206, the yeah. T206, went for $6.6 million and is now considered to be the highest priced card ever sold. So what was your reaction when you when you found out about all this? Because you said to yourself, you're not the biggest collector. So what does it feel like when someone says, hey, this piece of cardboard is worth north of $6 million? So my first reaction is, is what's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> No, seriously, you know, you're like when and part of our interviews and, and discussions involved, you know, I would I would I would express it the same way you did, which is you invested this much money in a piece of cardboard. Right. Now, obviously, that's ridiculous because you could say the same thing about you invested this much in a piece of in a canvas. You invested this much in in a, you know, a four thousand pound piece of metal that happens to have four tires connected to it. Um, so that's sort of silly on my part. But the fact is, yes, you're talking about a piece of cardboard. So I was amazed. I've watched this market over the years. I've covered other stories about um, baseball trading cards at different times in my career. So I've seen the market do this, you know, where it's really high and things are hot. Um, but I, I do think in, in looking at Kurt Rappaport's collection, when he spoke about it in the same terms of his art, and how beautiful the cards were. I don't think I fully appreciated that until he took out his 24 most valuable cards that he stores in a vault and that we show you in the piece that insurance requires that when he moves them, it's gotta be done with armed guards. And he brings them to his house and they're all laid out on this shelf. And you do see how beautiful they are. And in fact, in one of them, and I never knew this, in one of them, I'm like, wow, that looks like an illustration. That doesn't mm -hmm. look like a photograph. You know, the way I think of tops coming out and all the players come out one at a time and put the bat over their shoulder and they'd snap the shot. And he said, oh, no, 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 He says that year, they actually were drawn. Mm -hmm. They were paintings and, and pieces of art in that way. Not that photography can't be art, but they, they, they were so stunning. The colors were so vibrant and sharp. And um, it, was, it was really impressive. And then when you look at, you know, not only the Wagner cards, and, but the Jackie Robinson cards, again, just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Something for me that, that I really like about the hobby as well, to kind of piggyback off of that, is the storylines behind it too, right? The Honus Wagner card, whether, whether there's some folk tale to it or not, you know, the, the story is behind the T206, right? That there's a limited print because he didn't want his name associated with uh, tobacco and kids going after tobacco at a young age or with the Mickey Mantle, I believe it's the 52 tops where they made too many. So they started dumping them in the ocean and now there's not as not, there's not enough. And so now you have a scarcity there. So there's something about the storylines too. And I think that's the appeal to art, right? You have a Picasso, you have this, it's, you have a piece of history. You have one of the most iconic people uh, basically who painted this in your house. And I, I see that from the card angle. Did you feel like you gained any more perspective after being in that show, being with a bunch of maniacs? Like I was there maniacs like myself who put so much time, money and, and enjoyment uh, into this when we have free time. Do you feel like you gained a little bit more perspective on it? Or did you feel like you had a good hold on everything? Because for me, when I went into that environment at the National, it changed everything for me. And I've been in the hobby my entire life just to see how much it matters to people and really how much it's the core of a lot of people's lives. Yeah, I, I, I think that seeing it in person like that, you know, rather than individuals. I mean, look, you get when you talk about stories, you you get it when you watch Nate. Um you know, who's, who's from just outside of Nashville, Tennessee, and was selling homes, and by his own admission tells us that in his best year, you know, he made forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. And then he decides to go after his passion, and he opens up a trading card store, and he takes a one, you know, one small sum of cash that he's got and makes the investment. 
And all of a sudden the guy's making himself three, $4 million. And it's not just the money. It's the fact that he's doing something that he loves, that he is so knowledgeable about, that he's so passionate about. And I watched this guy lean over the counter and talk to kids, you know, and teenagers. And he's like, okay, let's talk about this. And let's, you know, here's what I'll give you. And let me look at the card. So absolutely. And, and it does, it gives you, not only are you, you sort of so impressed by the vastness of the show, but when you see that there are people there who are so knowledgeable, who've put their life earnings and their passion into it, there's, there's no question. And, and you see, and you also understand, you know, another side of the story is, is that when you see that the FBI is there, you know, <laughs> trying to, to mm -hmm. guard against fraud, and it comes under their art crime unit, the same way that these high pieces, pieces of art and artists that you've mentioned. Um, it's a billion dollar industry. Know, it, it, it is an industry and it's a serious industry. Yeah. So it's foolish for me to be dismissive of it in, in the sense of like, oh, it's a piece of cardboard. It clearly is a huge industry. Whether it sustains, who knows, you know, but like everything else, you know, what goes up comes down, but then it'll go up again. And something I was really drawn to in the HBO piece was the story of the 18 year old kid, Adam from suburbia, New York, who just graduated high school, who is now not going to college because of his tens of millions of dollars worth of trading cards. But Adam seemed like he was a really good kid. He was grounded. He was smart. He seems like he has a really bright future. I have a question for you, John. If your kid, if your kid came to you and said that he was going to forgo college and pursue a career in collectibles, would you let him? I, I, I would say my view is I would say no, only for the reason that I think that collectibles, it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong. Obviously they're, there are people who are doing it as a full-time career. It seems to me that you could trade cards on the side. And <laughs> you guys know from all our collected experiences at Syracuse University, there's enough downtime when you're at college. <laughs> there's enough downtime. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, and now, with, it wasn't true in my day, but now with the internet, you can certainly, and, and, and your phone, I mean, he could be trading and, and making deals on a, between classes. So point. I, I, I get that he sees that he has a career in this. Um, I get that he's passionate about it. I get that he sits there at the balance sheet and says, wait a minute, I'm going to pay X thousands of dollars for a college education when I'm already making more money than most people in the, in the country, in the world. He's worth more than his dad. Right. And, and so I get that equation. I certainly do. But I do think, look, there's, there's plenty of guys and women who started businesses when they were in college and they managed to do both. So it seems to me that this is, this is something he could handle. But hey, listen, college isn't for everybody. Well, you mentioned kind of going into this industry and jumping into it, and there's no better example than, than Adam there. And uh, there's always, and it's, it's an unfortunate cloud, but understandable cloud that always hangs over anything that booms. And uh, it's always, is this going to be a bubble that bursts? And you mentioned earlier about the industry itself outperforming the S&P. So, I mean, there's a level of just, yes, it's booming now, but it's consistently been pretty solid once we look past the 90s and the junk era, which you can blame a tangible uh, specific incident for why it affected the market, right? Overproducing. So now you look at it and you say, okay, well, they know not to do that. It's really just supply and demand really at this point and, and how the market continues. What is your take on everything? Now you went to the show, how popular it was there, how many new, I, I was talking to Jeremy Murray, the, the president of Beckett, who said there were more first time visitors to the show than ever before. And that's obviously a great sign. But at the end of the day, the people that are really pumping the money in aren't those first time visitors. It's the investors. It's the the people who are buying these $6 million cards who are coming off of Wall Street looking at alternative assets and stuff like that. That's what makes me a little bit nervous because there's a fragility there. What is your take on everything in terms of the bubble bursting question that almost seems to just always float around? Yeah, I, I think that um, you raised some good points about the, 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 the tangible part of it and, and what went wrong you know, 20, 25 years ago, 30 years ago the production of it all. It'll be interesting, for instance, now that Fanatics, the, the, the um, collectibles company and, and basically has dealt in merchandise, right, um, is now going to take over for tops with, with Major League Baseball. It'll be interesting if they understand the market 
um, and how much they want to produce, which which then leads me to believe, and, and I don't want to transition yet because you guys haven't taken me there, but to the NFTs, the non fungible tokens, and the video collectibles. Oh, that was coming. That, that okay. was, I don't get that. Sure we don't know what that is. <laughs> but, but but I think that that's the same thing when you talk about and and listen. I'm sure you can say the same thing in a certain way about art, um, less so about cars and watches, but. You know, is it is it a manufactured? Is it an artificial market? You know, uh, is there true supply and demand? Because in you know, car companies are not making cars. I mean, they are making cars in the sense of they know what the market is and what the demand is going to be, but they're not doing it in terms of the value of the car, right? They're not saying, well, let's only make. 20,000 of these, because then they'll be worth more. I mean, there may be certain small car companies that do that. I think the problem that lies within trading cards is, is a company doing that? Is a company creating the market by saying, we're only going to make five of these Giannis cards, or we're going to make 20 of these KD cards, or we're going to make, you know, whatever the number may be, um, uh, you know, for, for a certain player. And so, in that way, I think it's controlled and artificial. And I wonder about the success of the market, like where it goes from there. Your other point about these investors who traditionally have put their money elsewhere, be it in stocks or art, um, is this just a fad now? You know, COVID forced them to stay home. They couldn't go to galleries to look at art. Yes, you can look at something on a, you can look at a piece of art on, online, but it's not the same thing as going and seeing and appreciating it and looking at the, so. Are those people going to get tired of it all? Are they going to get bored and say, oh, time to move my money elsewhere. I'm, I'm done with this. Um, but I do see not just the guys who are spending five, six million dollars. And in a sense, it's all it's disposable income to the people, obviously, who are spending that much money. But I see guys who are very successful. They don't have retirement money. You know, they make very, very, very good livings and they work on Wall Street and they're doing the same thing. They're doing it, you know, on a, you know, maybe a slightly smaller level. They're spending twenty, forty, sixty thousand dollars on cards. Um, so, what's the long term future? I don't know. I do think that there is this sense of, wait a minute, who's determining the size of the pot? You know, the availability, yeah. the scarcity of all of it. That concerns me. And before if we being, get, if I'm being a cynic, <laughs> and and before we get into the NFT conversation, I mean it kind of does relate to the NFT conversation. I feel like the idea of risk isn't being discussed enough with all this because not every investment works out perfectly. I'd imagine there was a lot of kids like Adam at 18 who made similar investments that it didn't turn out so well for them, given the inherent risks of a hobby like this. And if not kids, maybe on a larger scale, adults. So so you, let, let, Let's yeah, take sorry, Adam for a second. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, Let's use Adam as an example. So Adam has a gut feeling and maybe also a keen eye, right? Yeah. And he says Giannis in Milwaukee is the superstar. And obviously he was the Greek freak. And everybody says, wow, okay, this guy's incredible. Um, let's say that Giannis, I don't know, comes down wrong, tears yeah. his ACL. I don't, I don't want to jinx the guy. So Adam has made this investment. Of, of multiple Giannis cards, some of them at, you know, 20, 50, $60,000. And whoop, there goes his collection. There goes yeah. his idea. And so all of a sudden, are we talking to Adam if his collection isn't worth X millions of dollars and it's only worth a fraction of that, or it's not even worth that. It's just a piece of cardboard again. You know, the Steven Strasberg, again, this is why guys who, who we spoke to tell us that traditionally the wiser investments, and you look at the Kurt Rapp reports, that the wiser investments are in the vintage cards, the guys who, who've who already hung up their, their jerseys, their cleats, put their gloves on the side, you know, they're done. Um, and it's why the Honus Wagner card is going to draw, you know, $6.6 .6 million. Um, and why the Steven Strasburg cards aren't worth very much, you know, so you can you know, you can, okay, take Judge in New York. Everybody says, oh, we're waiting for that real breakout. He's clearly a big star waiting for that breakout. Are his cards ultimately going to just be like, all right, he was a really good baseball player, but nothing more. Yeah, absolutely. He may, he may do more in his career. Yeah, in his I'm life. hoping he does more as a Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yankees guy over here. So here's you saying judge. He's like, he better be worth more. Soon. I'm like, he's not really good. He's very, very good, but I digress. <laughs> he, he, no, obviously he is. But I think that, you know, it, there's a perfect example. You know, there might be a kid out there who's, who's speculating, right. Just as you said, and, or, or gambling and saying, okay, I'm going to buy his cards and I'm going to buy a lot of them. And I'm going to wait. Cause he's going to be on that home run list. He's going to pass all those guys, he's going to be X, Y, and Z. Is he going to win a title? Is that going to, is that going to keep his, is he going to get injured? I hope not. No, of (laughs) course not. But it's, it's, I wouldn't wish that for any of these guys, but you know, that's the question. Now it's a good point because he's a really good player, but it seems like there's a level of with the card market, you have to exceed your expectations right now. I would say judge is meeting the expectations or, maybe just even a fraction below it because they were so high on him coming up after that rookie year that he had where everybody's dumping the money in because they're like, this is going to be the next superstar. And he's a really, really good player. And he's still not seeing that boom yet because he hasn't quite broken through that threshold. What's crazy is you talk about the, the old cards and I almost liken those to mutual funds. Right. And then you have the, the modern cards, which are more like some of them are like penny stocks and like this right here, And I know some people are listening, so they can't see it, but I'm holding up a Jason Dominguez card because Jason Dominguez is 18 years old. He's played 30 games or so in the minor leagues, but even before he had played a single game in the minor leagues, he's a Yankee super prospect. And uh, people are dumping thousands of dollars into this kid who is just turned 18. At the time he was 17, people are dumping that money into him. And there's a wide variance here. I mean, right now he's hitting 240 in low A. And, and he could still end up being a superstar, right? But when you look at something like that, right, and, and these kids are jumping after a Dominguez, and now we're talking about in baseball especially, the biggest risk you can imagine, right? Like you are – it's more likely that this doesn't pan out than it does. But people don't realize that, and they're just throwing the money there. Uh, what are your thoughts on that before we go over to the NFTs? I just wanted to wrap up on that. Sure, sure. I was looking, this card was staring me in the face over here. On my desk. <laughs> No problem. No problem. So he, here's here's my view. And this is since we've talked about uh, speculating and stocks and the stock market and such, I, I think you've hit on something that's really big. Let's say that Jason Dominguez is he's a startup, right? That's essentially yeah. what he is. I don't want to look at him. I, I hate to put somebody, a person, an individual as, as, a, as a commodity, but he is a startup, right? So think about all the startups. We hear about Google, Facebook. Apple, Amazon, Netflix, I could go on, right? Uh, Instagram, think about all the people that started companies that had similar approaches, that had offered the same sort of product, right? Oh, social media, let's talk, let's keep in touch, let's, right? We never heard about it. That list is so much longer than the list of the four or five, six companies I just talked about. How many companies have, I was just reading the other day, how many companies have started out to do what Tesla is doing, make the perfect electric car? We don't hear about it. That's what the majority of these ball players are. I mean, we all know that, even take trading cards out of it. We all know that just by prospects who come up through the minors, right, over the years. This guy's a superstar. That guy's going to be great. Fact is, is we know the percentages, you know, A tiny percentage are ever going to make it to the majors. And of the guys who make it to the majors, a tiny percentage are going to be Hall of Famers. So essentially, you're saying to yourself at at 18, with limited knowledge of baseball, even as much as you think you know, Hmm. you've got a limited amount of knowledge. I don't mean you guys. I mean, the average collector has a limited knowledge of baseball. And they're saying, I think that guy's the guy to invest in. I'm going to put thousands of dollars in that in the hopes that he becomes essentially you're looking for a hall of fame player. What are the odds? What are the odds? Not and great. Not great. <laughs> and speaking of limited knowledge, I have limited knowledge in the NFT market, non-fungible tokens. You interviewed someone at the tail end of the piece on HBO about NBA top shop, how he started with an investment close to $200,000 and it peaked at a high of 20 million from these digital assets. It's not the same. You can't hold it in your hand, but it's online. It's a JPEG. It's a highlight, but it's authenticated and it's verified by the NBA and the scarcity is what's so, I guess, unique about these highlights. You spoke with him. My question is why are these 
better or worse or just different than regular sports cards? Okay. So let's, let me do this because this was an education for me. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, people will say, well, this falls into the, the arena of cryptocurrency, right? Which I also know nothing about. So I'm, you and I are in the same boat. Okay. But I did do Let's a little, <laughs> I got a little bit of an education in, in, in this. First thing, the NFT stands for a non-fungible token. What that is really is, is the NFT is not the video highlight itself. Okay, it's not it's not that card or piece of art. The NFT is the digital technology that's involved that's imprinted into the item as a way to authenticate it so that it allows somebody to follow and track it in perpetuity. So there are pieces of artwork that now that have NFTs. What that means is there's been a digital imprint on it made so that you can track it. Cars could have it, watches could have it, other items that people want to collect or track. So you could say, well, this is an NFT, but yes, it's an NFT because of the authentication itself is not the NFT. I just want to make that so that, because I, had to, learn helpful. I, I <laughs> had to learn it. So it's just all of a sudden, it, all it is, is and in this case with the NBA and their partnership with Dapper Labs is Dapper Labs has put an authentication on it, right? They have, they've put a serial number that, that that video can be tracked. Okay, here's my takeaway. It's crazy. And yes, I'm a 57 year old guy who may not get tomorrow's, you know, where the future is going. It's insane. It doesn't make any sense to me, at least when it comes to these, to video highlights in sports. It may make sense in art to be able to track it, okay? But you're talking about, let's take the most popular one, which is the LeBron James dunk where he pays tribute to Kobe, right? And he does this dunk. So Dapper Labs issues, meaning authenticates, a thousand of those videos, clips. Number one is no different than 762, no different than number 433, okay? It's just the same video, it's not from a different angle. Number one of them doesn't have LeBron talking about it. It doesn't, you know, there's nobody, there's no commentary. It is the same seven to nine second video clip. The very same one that if in the course of talking to you, I went online and looked for it, I could watch it and I could watch it over and over and over. It's the same one that if you were watching ESPN and they wanted to do a tribute to LeBron James and they say, here are his best dunks, they would show you that video clip. It also doesn't allow, if I were doing a, you know, a documentary about LeBron James and I wanted to use that video clip, the owner of that video clip doesn't have the right to license it to me. I still have to go to the NBA. So you're owning something that you don't even own and that everybody else can own and that there's no distinction between what you have and what the guy who has number 1000 has. Now, back to the, what Arm said about the artificial market when it comes to trading cards, this is clearly an artificial market because they've made just a thousand of them. They could just as easily have authenticated 20 of them, right? And for some reason in this world of NFT collecting, they've decided that the one that has the video collectible, the digital highlight that has the number one authentication to it is worth more than number 640. Why? <laughs> like, okay. I don't know. Who knows, right? They could have said, hey, seven's my lucky number. So I'm going to determine the market as a whole says, oh, if you get seven, that's lucky. That's the most valuable. There's, a, there's no rhyme or reason. Okay. So number one has more value to it than number two, than number 722. Why? It's the same seven or nine seconds. Here's the other thing that we learned, and I know that there's been, and I'm sorry I'm going on at length about this, but there's, there's a sense that it was very hard to move your money in and out of NFTs, right? Mm. That if you decide that you want to unload one of your NFTs, you, you've traded it, you've sold it, um, you, you were take, it was taking the company more than several days. It wasn't instant. It wasn't like Venmo or any one of these other sites that, oh, you made a transaction, boom, and there's your, there's your real bank account, not, not your Bitcoin or your crypto or whatever. It's your real bank account. 
and the money wasn't getting there that fast. So it was, it was mm-hmm. our sense is that it's very hard to cash to, to make a trade in real time and see the money. Okay. The other thing was, is that you were limited in whether you could basically cash out because they're controlling the market, right? Like they're saying, no, 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 you can't. Because what happens if there's, if this guy, Mike Levy, who's, you can go online and you can see that there is a list of the, the, the people who have the top value of NFTs. And at the time he was number two with about $12 million. Well, let's say Mike wakes up tomorrow morning and says, you know what? I want my 12 million. I'm done. Okay. Well, they're saying, no, 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 you, you, you can't, you can't get all out at once. But on Wall Street, you can. Now it would be the same thing, right? If all of a sudden, if, if Leon Musk said, oh, I'm selling all my stock in Tesla, you'd be alarmed, yes, right? Well, why, alarmed. why is he, what, 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 what does he know? You know, does he know the cars are, aren't any good? I don't know. But point being that they're controlling the market. So it's not a, really a free market as, as we understand it. So I, I think that there are problems with the NFTs. And again, the most basic of it is that what you have, <laughs> I can watch anytime. <laughs> I, I, I could put it on a loop on my computer and put it in my living room and be like, oh, look, there's LeBron James doing, you know, dunking as a tribute to, to Kobe. What's the difference between mine and yours? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> It, that's where it's really hard for me to understand. And, and I know people probably will counter argue that with, well, I could just print out a, a picture of your card. Right. But it, it, it looks so different. It, there's just a level of, of authenticity. And I always use the term inherent value because what's the inherent value in this NFT? It's really just based on uh, what almost NBA top shot creates narrative wise, right. Psychology wise, where it's like, number one is the one you really want. And almost just subtly pushing these things into people's minds, whether you know it or not, is this is what you want. Now you have droves of people going after a specific area in that uh, collection or in that uh, industry. And and that's where it's really hard for me to understand. I I have three roommates and two of them are really into the NFTs and a lot of money in NBA Top Shot. And I've seen they're telling me how they can pull out and profit. And I'm like, do it, do it. Like, why are you not? I, I just don't see how it can go. Uh, any further, but they seem to believe that crypto and, and everything is going to continue to go. But the last thing I want to say on, on NFTs, on NFTs specifically with sports, is they believe in the cryptocurrency market. And, and long term, I do believe in a lot of facets of it from what I know and from what I understand, which is not very much. That mm-hmm. being said, could the crypto market boom? Does that necessarily mean that the NFTs and sports NFTs are going to continue to boom with it? Like, could those two be mutually exclusive? And that's an important component, too, for people that are maybe betting on NBA Top Shot or whatever it may be, because they believe in cryptocurrency, maybe more so than the actual Top Shot product. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer because I don't know enough about crypto and where that's going and, and what the future holds for us. And, you know, listen, we've long held the belief that we're always going to have cash and maybe we won't. Right. We, we all use cash and less than we ever did. So. Um, will that will that continue? And, and, and at a point, we we won't use cash. And so, so is the NFT market hitched? You know, hitched to that wagon of crypto? Maybe it is. Um, and maybe people say, well, look, you know, Mike Levy might say you use trading cards, but there's going to come a day when people don't use trading cards. But I'm with you. Not only can you hold them and feel them and 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 lay them out if you don't have Kurt Rappaport's $40 million collection, mm-hmm. but you know, you find a way to put them on your mantle. But the, the difference to me is, as you pointed out, that there is a tangible difference. You can look at one card next to another card and say, that has a crease in it. This, mm-hmm. The colors are more vibrant. Yours is worn out. Yours doesn't have, you know, the statistic side got smeared, whatever it is, there's a, there's a difference. There is not one difference between, you know, number one of LeBron's dunk and number 700. I will say, I will say that if the NBA and Dapper took a different approach, I mean, he, here's the analogy. Let's say that you guys download music, right? Of course, sure. Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Spotify? Okay, any one of those, right? Let's say that Spotify, uh, l- l- let's pick a Beatles song, Let It Be, okay? Good song. Good song. <laughs> yeah, it might do all right, I think. I think people will like it. Um, so let's say Let It Be is out there. Now you can download it. I can download it. And millions of others of people can listen to it or download it, right? Okay. If, if all of a sudden Spotify said, we're going to take 
a hundred versions of let it be, and we're going to authenticate them. <laughs> we're going to put some kind of digital chip into the one that you download, and you can download it instead of for free or on Apple for a dollar twenty nine. It's going to cost you ten thousand dollars. Well, why, Peter? Why would you pay ten thousand? An arm can get hear the same song now. If Spotify said, I'm going to attach to this Paul McCartney talking about how introducing the song and talking about how it got made, how the lyrics were written, who decided to write the music for the of the four, <clears throat> excuse me, who, who wrote the music, <clears throat> pardon me, if he gave you some background, so that made it, you know, it'd be like, yeah, you know, it'd be like if, if, if Picasso had given you some sort of written documentation of how he painted a certain painting, right? Or Pollock or any one of these folks had done that. Okay, that brings some value to it. There's your inherent value. There's your inherent value. And that that's what the NFTs don't have. Perhaps they will change that. It's such a new market and they'll figure out, eh, you know what, this isn't worth so much. I mean, somebody, the, the same Mike Levy was telling us that I think there was a Giannis play that was distributed. There's 40,000 of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> just a who lot. cares? Yeah. Who cares? Um, and so I, I think the, the NFT thing, I, I'm sure that I will end up with egg on my face and the market will evolve and it'll be hugely successful. And somebody will pull this out of the archives and be like, John Frankel is a moron. <laughs> and, and there's probably people already who are going to say that based on many other things I've said in my career, <laughs> but based on this, they'll be like, that guy doesn't know anything. Well, John, last one for me. After after watching your piece on HBO, after talking with you, I've spoken with Arm a thousand times. I really want to start investing. Like whether it be in the NFTs, I got to do my homework, like you said, or possibly some vintage trading cards. After you did the piece, do you do you feel that? Are you going to start investing or are you maybe, eh, maybe it's not for you? Not for me. Not for, not me. for me. Okay, well, there you go. Because, <laughs> because I think, because, because it goes back to where you started, Peter. Yeah. The very first question, which is what's involved? What's, what does it entail? What does it take? And it's homework yeah. and it's knowledge. And it's the same way that people study companies and read the small print. And it's the same way that the guys who, who got ahead of the, you know, the, the market in 2008, when the housing market crashed, who had read the small print on mortgages and loans and how they were being bundled and, and that it was all, you know, those guys who made billions and billions of dollars, it's Michael doing Burry. your homework, right? It's knowing why Facebook might be more successful. Yeah, there's luck involved as to why one startup might make it and another doesn't. They got more cash, they raised more capital, whatever it is, they met the right people, they, they got the right investor. Um, but in, in, in this case, I don't know enough and I don't, you on the other hand, because you follow baseball so passionately. And again, you know, who's to say how much knowledge you have compared to somebody who's been in the game for 40 years. I, I try my know. best, but you never know. You're right. <laughs> but, but if you follow it, then yeah. Would, would I say, take your life savings and drop it into this? Maybe not. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> And I also don't have to advise you on college since you're already through it. <laughs> God. Yeah, we made it out. And the funny thing for me is what got me into it. I've been collecting since I was a kid. It was something I shared with my with my father. And uh, that was the enjoyable part, right? Like going to get that Hall of Famer that I always wanted. The beautiful uh, Ernie Banks card that's pink. It was one I always wanted. I always just gravitated towards it. So I was like the art form of it. Uh, but now when, when you look at what's it's kind of as you released this, talked about it just a little bit. The big news that Tops is no longer going to be the exclusive license holder of you know, Major League Baseball for the cards, and that's going to end in 2025, where now Michael Rubin and Fanatics, which has just been a wagon, is going to continue to truck it forward here and uh, get into the sports cards market. Now that you've been doing this story almost simultaneously as this happens, what are your thoughts as we close here? on what that could potentially mean for the sports card market. Obviously there's a lot of unknown, but I'm just curious what kind of your pulse or what the pulse was that you got from some of the people you may have talked to, or just from being in it as this all happened and unfolded, what your thoughts are on all that. 
I, for full disclosure, we were as surprised to read about what Fanatics did and and the transactions that unfolded with Tops and Major League Baseball and the and the Players Association that was involved in all of that. Um, so I, I think Tops, from my sense of it, is that they had no idea this was coming either, right? Baseball baseball kept it very close to the vest, and they were negotiating with Fanatics on the side. I think what it does illustrate to us is one things change right that what we all grew up with tops being synonymous with trading cards um things you know there, there was a time when certain products were it and they, and they disappear so things change i think what it tells you is that with michael rubin and fanatics is that they clearly see this continuing to go up mm -hmm. right that guy is that guy has been a businessman since he was in high school we did a story on him that guy, that guy is an entrepreneur and a really smart guy, much smarter than I am. So when I sit here and tell you NFTs, you could probably have him on and he'd tell you exactly why NFTs are going to be huge. And this is only the beginning. <clears throat> but I think the fact that Michael Rubin and Fanatics got into this, <clears throat> pardon me, um, it only demonstrates that he sees this as growing. And I think that he has enough wherewithal to know how to make it grow. He clearly understands what sports fans want. I think already having this other company that makes merchandise, right? I mean, we know that the cards that have bits of jerseys are, are, are really valuable, right? Gameplay jerseys and such, um, you know, so now Michael's got this relationship with, and Fanatics has this relationship with the leagues and merchandise. So now he puts a player, he, he's able to get the player's jersey. What he can do to take that market and really explode it, because he's already got such a foothold in the industry, I think he can grow it in, in a way that, that we can't imagine yet. Um, again, you know, nobody can predict the bubbles. Nobody, nobody knows when things might soften. But I think when you got smart people like that doing it, it shows you what the future is. And, and, and Tops was probably moving in the right direction when they wanted to do, you know, had plans for an IPO. You know, unfortunately, the, the rug got pulled out from under that. But, but maybe not. Maybe maybe what Fanatics does is change the industry in a way that we couldn't have imagined. I hope so. And John, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a fantastic conversation. Be sure to check out his piece on Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. It airs tonight. We're recording on Tuesday, but this will come out on Friday. And it'll be airing all week, correct, on HBO Max? Yeah, it'll be on HBO Max. And then, of course, you can you can stream it. You can download it. You can, you know, probably watch it in ways, I again, I can't even imagine. Maybe but, it'll uh, turn into an NFT one day. I was going to say, is it serial, <laughs> serial numbered as an NFT? Do, do, do you guys know? I, I will say this in, in, in closing, that there was a gentleman whose article I read when we first started getting into this, who wrote a piece for the New York Times. He covers tech, and he explained NFTs in a very simple, understandable manner. And then as a joke, he went to his colleagues at the Times in the art department. He said, can you create a digital impression of my article, the headline? And no he way. joked with his his other colleagues and said, oh, what do you think I can sell this for? Like five cents, 10 cents, you know, a dollar. And he was going to raise money, whatever he got. And he was going to put it into the Times Cares, which is their nonprofit, which is they then make donations to. It sold for close to $500,000 because it was the first New York Times article NFT. And there was a guy in the Middle East in the, in the UAE who bought it because he somehow decides that this is going to have value one day, the first New York Times NFT. And I think the value, <laughs> like an arm, he's like, I, I don't know. Both looking or just... At you just floored $500,000. And you think about it, the first New York Times NFT, that realistically, if the market continues to rise, like I think a lot of us are predicting, that could be worth millions of dollars one day. But yeah. 500000 seems so insane. Insane, especially because if you think about it, whenever the New York Times first published in the 1800s, like I bet you the very first headline of the New York exactly. Times is not worth that much money. Yeah. It was that's, the beginning that's, that's, that's of the, the great, part. you know, that's like here was the most iconic, you know, here's or, or the most iconic headlines, you know, men land on the moon or whatever. None of them are worth that. But somebody has decided that because I've, I've it's got an authentication on it. But that survives the test of time too. Like that's the thing is it's, it's, that's what gives it value, right? Is it survives time. It hasn't disintegrated. Like this digital thing will never, ever uh, 
really fatigue. Right? That's that's where it's to me. Maybe we could just take a little screenshot of this. It was our, our first uh, <laughs> our, our first conversation here with John Frankel and NFT that and see what we get. Oh, God. I, you know what? I don't really want to know my value on the market. <laughs> I bet <laughs> it's more be, than you think. That'd be really depressing. That'd be so sad. You guys have a future in front of you. I, you know, I got a great future in my rearview mirror. It but it's like, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to know how little I'm worth. But it would be mutual fund, John. If we <laughs> all did NFTs and we came out and someone evaluated them at like five or ten dollars while the market is booming, that that wouldn't be very good for our egos. But no, John, no. thank you so much for joining us. We hope to have you on again, maybe next year when we're talking about the Honus Wagner card being twelve million dollars. We have no idea. I, I, I bet you, I bet you, guys. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure, and best of luck to you, you guys. Have produced something that's terrific. So keep going. Thank you so much, thank John. You, John.